All right, so we had the heart here. You know, we've been talking about the heart as a pump. We talked about how it's got its own intrinsic system of stimulating contraction. What is the little place where it all starts? What kind of drives the whole cardiac cycle? Sinoatrial node, SA node. SA node, the sinoatrial node, this little collection of autorhythmic cells here. Um, and again, on its own, it will send out little depolarizations about a hundred times a, a minute. So it's um, intrinsically, SA node is around a hundred beats per minute. Um, that can be modified by the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system can slow it down. Again, parasympathetic, you know, um, through innervated through the vagus nerve is typically keeping it down more about 70 beats per minute for kind of a resting heart rate. Um, it can be sped up by the sympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic activation will speed up the SA node. But on its own, it's going to continue beating, right? If you, like I said, the old zombie scene where somebody rips somebody's heart out of their chest through their gaping cavity where their rib cage used to be, their heart's still going to be beating in the hand, right? So it keeps going. Then we had the little intranodal pathway for 0.1 to 0.2 seconds to the AV node, and then to the bundle of hiss and the bundle branches. So that should all feel, should all feel um, familiar. Um, we talked about the cardiac muscle that makes up the myocardium. And then we also talked about the myocardium also had um, some connective tissue, the fibrous skeleton of the heart. You know, there was the um, connective tissue that helps anchor the valves as well as electrically isolates the atria from the ventricles. So the atrial depolarization doesn't spread automatically to the ventricles that you need that internal pathway taking the excitation from the SA node to the AV node. Um, and we saw, we talked about in the EKG, you can actually see if there's some issues with that internodal pathway. Sometimes you can get a P wave that doesn't result in a QRS wave. You can kind of miss a beat. Um, there are other arrhythmias that we should probably mention while we're here. you know, things where the rhythm of the heart is not going according to the normal rhythm. Um, again, we talked about if there's something wrong with the internodal pathway, you can get a thing where you can, instead of just going P, Q, R, S, T, you can get a P wave and then a P. So you can actually have a P wave that is sitting alone and didn't result in a QRS. That's if there's some issue with this internodal pathway. Again, we talked about there's a possibility if there's something wrong with the bundle branches. You know, these conductive, these Purkinje fibers, these conductive fibers that spread the excitation quickly through the ventricular muscle. If that isn't functioning properly, you can get, instead of having a nice tight QRS, you can have a P and a QRS that gets kind of spread out. It's still squeezing, but it's more instead of um, other things that go wrong is fibrillation. So this is kind of more of kind of a chaotic quivering. So like I mentioned, the the cardiac muscle actually has its own autorhythmicity on its own, even without this pacemaker system. Um, it's just, it's usually kind of slower than, um, you know, it's, it's, this thing entrains all the rest of the cardiac muscle, 
but the cardiac muscle will actually kind of on its own, even without this coordinating system. So things can go wrong if this is not in training, is not kind of coordinating everything. You can have these fibrillations where you can have either the atria or the ventricles just kind of quivering kind of in this chaotic manner rather than in this coordinated sending the blood where it needs to go. Um, if you have ventricular fibrillation, you are in trouble because the ventricles are the main pumping chambers that are sending the blood out to your body. So if you're in ventricular fibrillation, if you don't fix it soon, you're gonna die, right? Because the ventricles, instead of doing their kind of coordinated, pushing the blood out during, you know, ventricular, you know, isovolumetric contraction and ventricular ejection and sending the blood out to the body, they're just going um, so the blood's just sloshing around. Um, what do you typically do if somebody is in ventricular fibrillation? Electricity, you give. Electricity, exactly. Those are those paddles, those defibrillators. They go, boom, right? You've seen, everybody's seen that on a TV show or something. Um, and if any now, whenever you go, most any place you are, whether you're in an airport or a convention center, You'll see these things on the wall, the AEDs. These are these automatic defibrillator things that you can use to um, defibrillate. Basically, it's kind of like if your computer is frozen and it's like, it's just not responding. I don't know what the heck's going on. Let's just turn it off and turn it back on and hope it boots up and it's probably gonna be working again. So that's what this these defibrillators do. It's kind of like, the power off, power on, and hope it the heart boots up again and is functioning correctly. So that's that's what those those paddles are doing. It's basically trying to just reset this system so now this intrinsic conduction system of the heart is coordinating everything properly. Um, other kinds of fibrillation, you can get atrial fibrillation, AFib. Um, Again, they call it usually AFib is the, and this is actually not uncommon. Um, this one is not as, um, it's not gonna be fatal, at least in any short term, because like I talked about, the atria aren't major players in pumping your blood around. When the atria contract, it's maybe the last, you know, 15% of the blood that's in the atria get transferred into the ventricles, but it's, not the major amount. Most of the blood is just flowing in through the vena cava or through the um, pulmonary veins and just passing through into the ventricles. So if the atria are not pumping in a coordinated fashion, you're still getting plenty of blood getting pushed out to your body to keep you alive well. But what does happen, the big danger with AFib is because the blood is not doing its normal flow is just kind of kind of hanging out in the ventricles without getting um, kind of moved along well, you're in a much higher danger of having a thrombus, having a little clot form that shouldn't be forming. Um, and we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. If you have a blood clot that forms when it shouldn't, and then it breaks free and then goes sailing through your, you know, your blood vessels, You know, I could have a blood clot and it's fine here, it's moving, it's fine, it's fine, but then, ooh, it finally gets to a small enough branch and now it's blocking all the flow. So this is like a thrombus, is if you have a, um, a clot that shouldn't be there. Embolus is if it's on, embolus is something on the move through the vessels. It could be, there's an air embolism too. Embolus is just when something is moving through that shouldn't be. And then it gets to a branch that's small enough and it blocks all subsequent blood flow. And now you've got a stroke or a heart attack or something, you know, where you're, so it's very dangerous to have these aberrant clots forming because if they break free 
and become an embolus, they can again cause a stroke by doing that. So when people have AFib, um, first, if it's really bad, they can actually do, they call it cardioversion. I use electric, again, another an electrical um, current across to try to reset that. There are drugs that help try to kind of stabilize it. But most of the people who have atrial fibrillation are also on blood thinners, the things that inhibit um, blood clotting, like we saw in our lab. What in our lab inhibited blood clotting? Aspirin. The aspirin. aspirin. You know, and again, there's, and there's a lot of pharmaceuticals like Coumadin and stuff, and there's a few, there's just some new ones. So people who have problems with atrial fibrillation are often on these blood thinners because the blood is not doing, it's just in and moving along since it's kind of sloshing in here, it's more likely to form a little clot. So they're gonna be on blood thinners to make it less likely that there's some clot that's gonna form and break free and you know, give them a stroke or something. Um, all right, so other thing about the heart, this is something um, we mentioned very briefly, like when Morgan brought up the idea of cardiac tamponade, I brought up the idea of the pericardial sac. So let me spend a few moments talking about the idea of serous membranes in the body. If you've been in anatomy, you know what these are, but we should talk about them for the heart and they're gonna become particularly relevant when we get to the respiratory system next. So let me talk about serous membranes. And then we'll, we'll bring it back to the heart, obviously. Um, they're also called serosa. You know, again, the basic idea here is you've got all these organs that are really like active and dynamic in your body. Your heart is pumping and pumping and pumping and moving and squishing. Your lungs are inflating and deflating and inflating and deflating. Your stomach and your intestines are smooshing your food and moving it all over. So there's all this dynamic smooshing and sliding. And again, as you know, if you just rub yourself fast, it starts heating up and you start gonna, you're gonna like tear a hole in your skin. You got all that friction. So we need ways for all of these organs that are all dynamic and moving and sliding past each other to be able to have this friction, friction-free surface so they're not going to be rubbing each other raw. Um, yeah, I don't know what, I mean, when I was a kid, it's no longer PC, we used to call it giving someone an Indian burn. Like if you're like really, you know, so you don't want your, your, um, your internal organs giving each other these friction burns as they all rub against each other. So, they are all wrapped in these double layers of membrane with this slippery fluid in between. So it looks like this. Like, let's say this is, this is let's just make this be the uh, generic organ, but it could be your heart. Or it could be your lungs, or it could be your intestines and your stomach. So this is my organ. And then there's going to be two layers. It's very thin. The, the, these membranes are made out of simple squamous epithelium. So they're, they're very thin. There's one layer that goes against the actual wall of the organ itself. This is going to be the visceral layer. So we could call it the visceral serosa, or um, it'd be the visceral layer of your pericardium if it's around your heart. So viscera just means organ. So it's a layer against the organ. Then there's gonna be another layer. This is gonna be my parietal layer. Parietal means wall, so it's the one that's closer to the body wall, right? So one layer is closer to the organ, one is further out towards the body wall. 
And then there is this slippery fluid in between, serous fluid. Right, so in fact, I should. So this is the basic idea here. Um, like if I, I'm gonna stop this. And now here, this, this bag here is two layers and I'm gonna take some slippery stuff, put it inside there. So now I've got, um, now I've got this, double layer thing with slippery, slippery fluid in between. And I can, I can rub my hands and rub my hands and they're not heating up because the two thin layers are just sliding past each other with that slippery fluid in between, right? If I didn't have that, I was just rubbing my hands. My hands are really warming up. There's a lot of friction there. But if I have this, double layer with slippery fluid in there. I can rub and rub and rub and rub and rub and they are all, it's all good. So this is what's around your heart. This is what's around your lungs. This is what's around all of your digestive organs. This double layer of serosa to keep things from having that friction burn. Um, and I should also, it's, it's, the action, it's the space in between is kind of like a virtual space. It's not like there's a whole bunch of space. It's like two piece, two flat things, almost touching, but with this layer of slippery stuff. There's like a vacuum in between. If I try to pull it apart, they don't really want to pull apart because it's kind of a vacuum. That's actually going to be important as well when we get to the respiratory system, when we look at how the lungs um, are going to inflate and deflate. It's going to depend on the fact that there's a vacuum between the parietal and visceral layers between of these two um, serosa layers. If I, right, if I think about if you have two microscope slides, I'm sure you've done this where you're trying to wash microscope slides and they're wet and they can slide with respect to each other. But if you try to pull them sideways, they don't go because there's a vacuum. You can slide them. But if you try to separate them, it's like they don't want to separate because there's a vacuum between. So you can think about these two layers, they slide really nice, but they're still kind of practically touching with the thin slippery layer in between. And if you try to pull them apart, they don't want to pull apart because of that vacuum. All right. Back to our So serosa, serous membranes. Um, there are three ones that you need to know. The one across around the heart is the pericardium. That's the one we're gonna come back to. That's the thing that's kind of launched us on this slight tangent here. The one around the lungs is called the pleura. That's going to become important um, as soon as we start talking about pulmonary ventilation. And then the peritoneum. Around your digestive viscera. You know, in, in this class, we're not going to get into detail about the peritoneum. In anatomy, I'm sure you remember the greater and lesser omentums and the transverse mesocolon and the mes all these mesenteries and everything. Um, but in this class, you should definitely, we are going to talk a little more about the pericardium 
and we'll definitely be talking about the pleura. Um, so let's get back to the heart now. So the heart has those two layers. It has a layer that's against the actual heart itself, which is gonna be the visceral pericardium. And then there's a layer that is outside of that which is gonna be the parietal pericardium. The difference in the heart compared to the other organs is that the parietal layer has this additional fibrous reinforcement, kind of this leathery backing on it. Um, so then there's this dense connective tissue So parietal pericardium, you know, with this fibrous the fibrous layer. Ah! Um, so the basic idea here is this is like a leathery bag. They call it the pericardial sac. All right, so if you cracked somebody's chest open hoping to see their heart beating there, you'd be disappointed. Instead, you'd see this little leathery bag with something pulsing inside of it. If you actually want to see the heart, you'd have to take a scalpel and slice open this little leathery bag to actually see the heart in there. Um, again, this has that slippery fluid in between that makes sure that as the heart is beating, it's not rubbing itself against your, you know, your chest and your lungs and everything else. And, um, this is how you get cardiac tamponade. It's the thing that we talked about last time. If something does build up, if there's some bleeding or fluid buildup in here, that's going to compress the heart and then it's going to make it harder for the heart to fill properly because normally there should not be any, it should be kind of a virtual space with just a super thin layer of slippery fluid in there. So that would be like cardiac tamponade if something is, if there's something volume building up between the layers and therefore compressing and limiting the ability of the heart to fill. Um, so there's that, you know, before we move on to the, um, kind of our next, we're going to be talking about blood pressure. One other thing, like pathological condition that I've alluded to, but I want to talk about kind of more directly is congestive heart failure. So, and again, this is going to be good because it reviews the basic idea of cardiac output versus blood pressure. Again, the heart is two pumps. Again, I'm not drawing this anatomically correct. You've got the systemic circuit going out to the body. returns to the right side, vena cava, the pulmonary arteries go off to the lungs, picks up oxygen, heads back through the pulmonary veins, back to the heart. So this was, and, and then again, remember we talked about there are other circuits. There's the coronary circulation. There are the portal systems, which we'll look at in more detail later. This is the basic idea. 
systemic circuit and the pulmonary circuit. What do we know about the cardiac output on, well, what is cardiac output? What's the definition of cardiac output? The amount of blood that it's uh, coming out from a ventricle. And what are in a, a little more even, that's part of it, even more specifically. Heart rate and stroke volume. It's heart rate times, so it's heart rate times stroke volume. And what are the units of cardiac output? Liters per minute. Going to be liters per minute. It's the liters per minute coming out of either ventricle. And what do we know about the cardiac output on the left side versus the cardiac output on the right side? They're the same. It has to be the same, right? Because everything that comes out the left side is returning on the right side. Everything that's coming out on the right side is returning on the left side. So if there is an imbalance, you're going to get back pressure building up on one side or the other. And that's the basic idea of, card, of congestive heart failure is when the heart is starting to lose, usually one side or the other is losing the ability to fully pump as strong as it needs to, to keep up with the other side. Um, in which case you start building up back pressure. If the pulmonary side is still pumping strongly, but the left side can't keep up with it, you're gonna have pulmonary congestion. You're gonna have congestion where you're gonna build up pressure on the lung side. You'll start having fluid leaking out of the capillaries and get fluid buildup in the tissues. Um, so you can have pulmonary congestion. Um, if you have the opposite condition where the right side is not able to keep up with the left side. The left side is pumping out to the body, but the right side is like, oh, I can't get it all going. You're gonna get buildup of pressure on the systemic side. Um, and that's called peripheral congestion. Peripheral congestion, you're gonna have, you end up with edema. Edema is when you've got more and more kind of fluid getting into the interstitial spaces between the cells rather than just staying inside the bloodstream. Um, so congestive heart failure is basically this imbalance between cardiac outputs when the heart is having trouble um, pumping the blood that it needs to. Um, okay. Let's, let's, let's continue here. All right, so now we're gonna talk about control of blood pressure. And this is going to bring in all of these concepts we've been talking about. To understand control of blood pressure, you have to understand those equations we were talking about around cardiac output related to pressure, related to resistance. You have to understand the relationship of um, stroke volume to end diastolic to end systolic volume. You have to understand the relationship of cardiac output to heart rate times stroke volume. All of those things are going to play a role in understanding how the body has all these different ways to maintain your blood pressure in its target zone at the, at the value it's trying. Um, there's going to be short term versus long-term. So some things are gonna be about in the moment, trying to bring the blood pressure up or down because it's dropped or whatever. There's gonna be long-term where you're trying to just maintain the set point of your normal resting blood pressure. And we'll see there's actually crossover in here. Some of the 
In fact, one of the most important um, controls of blood pressure, renin angiotensin mechanism, which we're going to look at in detail, has elements of both short-term and long-term. Um, there's neural versus chemical. Um, some of the controls for blood pressure are mediated mostly by the sympathetic nervous system, right? Where you send a message out to the smooth muscle in a artery. What happens if you contract the smooth muscle in the walls of an artery? Uh, resistance will go up. Exactly. So the resistance is going to go up. And what's going to happen to the blood pressure? Will go up. The blood pressure is going to go up. Exactly. So some way you can control blood pressure is by just neural pathways, by adjusting the diameter of vessels, which is going to adjust your blood pressure. Chemical messages, there's a lot of um, chemicals, hormones, and other messengers that we're going to talk about that affect either the diameter of your vessels or affect your heart rate that will adjust your blood pressure. So there's gonna be neural mechanisms versus chemical mechanisms, short-term mechanisms versus long-term mechanisms. And there's gonna be a lot of crossover as well. Um, there is one last kind of concept that I need to bring in in order to talk about blood pressure. And it has to do with one of the most important long-term controls. So things like increasing or decreasing your heart rate or constricting or relaxing blood vessels, these are all temporary things that can take your blood pressure up or down, but if you want to set the, you know, kind of your resting um, blood pressure, what is kind of just your set point blood pressure that you are then able to move up and down from? The main control, long-term control of blood pressure is actually blood volume. So we need to, I'm going to write this out in big letters so it's real obvious. So this will make sense if you kind of realize that the cardiovascular system is a closed system. So again, you have the heart pumping out. And again, let's just make it simple with one circuit here. Here's the body. Blood's coming back to the heart. You know, I alluded to this when we were talking about the shifting, uh, you know, shifting the blood from the veins into the arteries. When we talked about increasing venous return, you know, increasing the end diastolic volume, I kind of drew the same picture. But this idea that the cardiovascular system, this is a closed system. So while you can make adjustments in the blood pressure by constricting and relaxing the diameter of vessels or speeding up or slowing down the heart. The main long-term control of blood pressure in this thing is just by how much overall blood is in the closed system. If there's too much, then you're gonna have chronically kind of high blood pressure that you're gonna to have to deal with. If there's not enough and the whole system's kind of limp and flaccid, you're gonna chronically not have enough and you're gonna have to work hard to try to keep the blood pressure up, right? So the main control of just having a nice resting blood pressure is having the right amount of blood 
in the system. What system, what organ is actually the main way of controlling fluid balance in your body? Kidneys. The kidneys. The kidneys. So this is mainly done by the kidneys. So your kidneys are one of the major players in adjusting your blood pressure. We're going to see in a few moments one of you know the renin angiotensin mechanism, which is a major player in blood pressure control. Renin, renin comes from the kidneys, renal, um, partly because the kidneys need to keep the blood pressure up to function, but they're also just a major player um, when we're talking about how do we do long-term control of blood pressure, it's pretty much by talking to the kidneys and telling them to like, you know, conserve water, keep your blood volume up if you want to keep the blood pressure up or peeing more if you want to keep the blood pressure down. A major, we're going to talk about three major kinds of drugs people take to help control hypertension, like high blood pressure. One of the major types of drugs that people take for high blood pressure are diuretics. Things that make you pee more. That's why I drew it in yellow. Um, but so if you're trying to control high blood pressure, you try to have them pee more, get more water out of the body, um, more water out of the body, then means there's less volume in this overall closed system, which means the overall resting blood pressure is going to be lower. Um, on the opposite side, we're going to see the renin angiotensin mechanism, which is trying to raise your blood pressure, is actually going to talk to your kidneys to tell them to conserve water. Talk to your hypothalamus, make you thirsty, so you want to drink more water, bring it into your body. Um, so again, I drew this in big letters because it's important. Um, and it could be non-intuitive if you haven't thought about this much before. Like your urinary system, your water balance is at the core of long-term control of blood pressure. Um, and we're gonna see it ties in with all the other things we've been talking about with diameter of blood vessels, with heart rate, with things like that in terms of how to all these mechanisms that control and adjust blood pressure. Okay, so now we can get to some of the specifics about mechanisms that control blood pressure. Um, there is a, a bunch of them. I'm gonna give you a couple of the main ones. Um, one is called, one of them, simple neural mechanisms is called the baroreceptor reflex. So we need to talk about baroreceptors. So a baroreceptor, you know, baro is pressure, or right? a barometer is measuring the air pressure. You know, the way you measure blood pressure is basically having a stretch receptor in an artery. Here's an artery. We have a little stretch receptor in here. That's what a baroreceptor is. <clears throat> you know, when the blood pressure is higher, this thing stretches out more, right? When the blood pressure is lower, it's less stretched out. So by monitoring the stretch of these major arteries, you know, and these are, you have these like in the aorta, in the carotid arteries, you know, other large arteries. You know, especially in the kind of in the thoracic region. So in these major arteries that are kind of, that are you're using to like, control blood pressure, you have these stretch receptors, which again, 
In this particular context, we're going to give them the special name barrow receptors because you know we're they're measuring blood pressure. And if the barrow receptor notices the blood pressure dropping, they'll have a quick neural reflex, which will try to raise the blood pressure back up. Um, one of the examples here is what we call you know, in orthostatic hypotension. You know, if you are lying down, you're in, you're like taking a nap. Here's your heart. Here's your brain. You know, the blood doesn't have to fight too much to get to your brain. There's no gravity it's fighting. Um, now all of a sudden you're gonna stand up. Ortho means straight. So now you're standing up. Here's your heart and here's your brain. But all of a sudden it's like, whoa, the blood now has to fight gravity to get up to your brain. So if you leave everything equal as it was where the system was happy when you were lying flat and all of a sudden you stand up, there is not enough blood pressure to get the blood to your brain. And unless you make some quick adjustments, you are going to pass out. Um, you know, syncope is the official word for blacking out. Um, so this baroreceptor reflex is gonna kick into gear. You know, within a fraction of a second, you are going to constrict the blood vessels. Um, you know, constrict arteries. We, we know that blood pressure is cardiac output times resistance. Increasing resistance is going to increase blood pressure. It's going to increase the heart rate immediately. Increased heart rate, increased cardiac output is increasing blood pressure. So by doing these two quick neural responses, you're going to increase the blood pressure and keep the pressure adequate to keep perfusing the brain so you don't black out. So this is an example. This is this baroreflector reflex. Your system, your nervous system saw a drop in blood pressure via the stretch of the vessels, these baroreceptors, and it has both vasoconstriction and heart rate as options to adjust and increase the blood pressure and keep it at the level that you want it. You know, as you get older, um, your reflexes slow down. It's more likely if you get up too fast and you're really old that you're gonna have a head rush or you're black out because this baroreceptor reflex isn't working as fast and you don't have enough blood before you actually go, whoa, it was not enough blood. I'm starting to feel a little, feel a little funny. So does this make sense, this baroreceptor reflex? This is an example of a neural control. This is basically the stimulus is drop in blood pressure. The response is these neural control of arterial diameter and heart rate to adjust blood pressure. And Professor, the orthostatic hypotension, is, is that describing which part? Is it describing the process of the standing up and the heart yeah. rate? Yeah, it's the orthostatic hypotension. Hypo means low, this means low blood pressure. Orthostatic means like you've stood up and you're standing still standing up. So orthostatic hypotension is the condition that results from lying down to standing up and having that drop in blood pressure necessary to get to your brain. And then this baroreceptor reflex is the response to make sure that you maintain adequate blood flow to the brain. Um, next, we're gonna get into one of the core controls of your blood pressure, which is going to involve mostly chemical controls and is going to also involve both long-term and short-term control of blood pressure. And it's the renin angiotensin mechanism. Uh, 
All right. So this one has lots of moving parts to it. And you do need to understand all the moving parts. There's gonna be different, different uh, molecules that are playing a role. They play different roles in different aspects of blood pressure. Like I said, it's gonna be both long-term and short-term control. And this is also gonna be the target of another major class of, of um, blood pressure meds. All of the um, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin convert angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. So this is another major access point to trying to control high blood pressure is this renin angiotensin mechanism. So let me explain the different parts of it. This is also going to be relevant to this whole freaking COVID-19 um, pandemic because the one of the major receptors that's part of this is also the access point, how the coronavirus gets into your cells. So let us, it starts at the kidneys. Kidneys, kidneys. So kidneys detect drop in blood pressure. This is, a, this is how it starts. How it begins. Um, it can also be triggered directly by the sympathetic nervous system. So sympathetic autonomic nervous system. Um, we're gonna talk more about the kidneys and the specific parts of the kidneys that are doing this. This is in the juxtaglomerular apparatus of the nephrons with the uh, juxtaglomerular cells and stuff. Um, for right now, don't worry about the details. Just know there's a special little detector in the kidneys that's noticing the blood pressure dropping and it releases this, it's an enzyme, it's this thing it releases called renin. So this is, it gets the name renin, things that have to do with the kidneys are renal, like the renal arteries, the renal tubules, you know, renal calculi or kidney stones. So renin is this thing released by the kidney. Um, into the bloodstream. And I talked about, we're gonna talk more about plasma proteins. Um, a bunch of plasma proteins are gonna be involved in this renin angiotensin mechanism. So I'm gonna be talking about some proteins in the bloodstream. Um, one of the proteins that's just normally in the bloodstream is called angiotensinogen. This is just a plasma protein. So can I think, remember we talked about fibrinogen. You have these plasma proteins that are just waiting there for their moment to do what they're supposed to do. When it says something inogen, that means it's a precursor version. This is not the active version. Just like fibrinogen is not the active version of fibrin. Fibrinogen is soluble, it's just waiting in lying in wait in the plasma until there's a clotting cascade, in which case it gets turned into fibrin. Angiotensinogen is just sitting there waiting to do its thing until renin comes into the picture. Um, renin is then gonna catalyze the conversion of angiotensinogen into angiotensin one. And this is catalyzed by renin. So now we're off and running. So this is the first step in this whole cascade of events that's gonna happen. 
This renin, which was released by the kidneys, is now converting this angiotensinogen, which was just this plasma protein lying in wait, into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is then going to get further converted into this thing called angiotensin 2. This is converted by, this is catalyzed, catalyzed by ACE. ACE, in fact, maybe I'll, let me use my typing tool. And geotensin converting enzyme. So angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE. This is primary local, primarily localized in the lung tissue. Um, remember I talked about how you can have enzymes that are anchored in cell membranes. So as the blood flows through the lungs, the angiotensin one is going to be turned into angiotensin two. The angiotensin II is then going to be the thing that's actually doing stuff. Um, just as an aside, these little places on the membrane where these um, ACE, um, these angiotensin converting enzyme things are anchored on the membrane, that is how the coronavirus gets into, into cells. Right, the virus needs to have, recognize some marker and grab on and inject itself into the cell. This is what it uses. It uses one of the subtypes of these um, ACE receptors to grab onto and get into the cell. That's part, you know, part of the COVID pneumonia thing is they can get into the cells that are going down um, into your lung tissue and mess up the ability to kind of sweep out the mucus and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it's obvious that this coronavirus does a lot of other stuff and really nasty stuff, but one of the things it does is gets into your lung tissue and messes up the ability to kind of clear out all the fluid. Um, all right, so now, we still haven't talked about blood pressure. So far, we've just talked about this big cascade of events. And again, let me just, kidneys detect a drop in blood pressure. They therefore release renin. Renin is going to convert, this is three. Renin converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin one. Four, angiotensin one becomes angiotensin two. So now we'll talk about why does this bring the blood pressure back up, right? This was a response to a drop in blood pressure. So the response are gonna be things to bring the blood pressure back up. So what does angiotensin two do? So one, it is a potent vasoconstrictor. So here, this is going to make sense based in these short-term controls. It's constricting arteries, and that's going to jack up blood pressure. Remember, again, blood pressure is cardiac output times resistance. So if we're jacking up resistance by vasoconstriction, you're going to increase blood pressure. Two, it's going to stimulate the release of two different hormones. Um, one is it stimulates release of ADH by the pituitary gland. So that means we have to talk a little bit about ADH.
So ADH equals antidiuretic hormone. Um, it's also called vasopressin. Um, so what does it mean to be an antidiuretic? You pee more. You pee more. No, no. Diuretic makes pee you less. pee less. <laughs> this is going to make you pee less. Um, what does that mean in terms of your blood pressure? It increases. Why? because you're retaining more water, so there's more blood volume. Exactly, so retain H2O, increase blood volume. And we talked about keeping the blood volume up is the way to keep blood pressure up. Um, ADH also stimulates thirst. What part of the brain is it talking to? Hypothalamus. Hypothalamus. Exactly. You know, by making you thirsty, that's also going to help increase blood volume. You're taking more water into your body. So ADH, you pee less, helps keep your blood volume up, makes you thirsty, helps keep your blood volume up. Those are both long-term controls. Um, ADH is also a potent vasoconstrictor in of its own right. So that is another short-term control. Keeping, so both um, angiotensin II is a vasoconstrictor and ADH is a vasoconstrictor. So we've got two aspects of short-term control here by vasoconstriction. We've got a couple of things of long-term control with these things that increase blood volume. You can also see now why ADH is also gets the nickname vasopressin because it helps increase blood pressure. You know, it's vasovessel pressure. So constricting the vessels, that's how it gets its name. It, it makes the vessels constrict. That's why it gets its name vasopressin, but more commonly you call it antidiuretic hormone because it also makes you pee less. Again, when we get to the when we get to the urinary system, we'll talk about the specifics of what is ADH doing in the kidneys and how does it work and how does it make you pee less and all that. Um, all right, so angiotensin two, in and of itself, potent vasoconstrictor two. It stimulates the release of ADH by the pituitary, which does all this stuff. And three, stimulates the release of aldosterone by the adrenal cortex. So the adrenal gland we'll talk about in more detail. The Adrenal gland has two parts. So the adrenal medulla, the inside, which has like the epinephrine, the adrenaline, but then the outer part makes a bunch of these steroid hormones, including aldosterone. And aldosterone um, tells the body to conserve salt, conserve sodium. Um, so what effect is that going to have by telling the kidneys? So this tells the kidneys to, you know, talk to the kidneys. By telling the kidneys to keep sodium in the body, why would that be helpful for keeping blood pressure up? It's increasing the intracellular uh, osmotic. It's, the osmotic. Or it's, it's osmosis. Totally. It's just osmosis. You're pulling the salt back into the body, the water's gonna stay in the body, right? Remember I told you osmosis is never going away. By pulling the salt, keeping the salt in the body, you're gonna keep your blood volume higher. So this 
part three is also one of these long-term controls. We're gonna be retaining water. We're gonna be conserving salt, which also helps retain water. Those keep the blood volume up, which then keeps your blood pressure up. So are there any questions about all of this stuff I just mentioned? This um, stimulation of the release of aldosterone, is that a long-term or a short-term effect? This is long-term, right? Because you're oh, talking blood to the volume. kidneys and doing blood volume. So this anti, this, this renin angiotensin mechanism is both affecting long and short-term stuff. Um, so another really important drug used for, for um, control of high blood pressure are called angio, they're called ACE inhibitors. There's a whole bunch of them like ramalopril. They're usually something, something opril. And so these inhibit angiotensin converting enzyme. So why is this gonna be useful for controlling high blood pressure? Given everything we've been talking about and if we go back to the very beginning here where I was saying, you know, we start with having uh, renin released and going to make angiotensin II. This is basically putting the kibosh right here. It's saying, okay, we started this cascade, but now we're inhibiting ACE, inhibiting angiotensin converting enzyme, which means we never get here. We never make the angiotensin II. Why is that going to help control high blood pressure? We won't release uh, ADH and aldosterone. Exactly. Right? If we go look at all the stuff that happens, if you do have a angiotensin II, one is a vasoconstrictor, and we're not going to have that. It stimulates ADH, which you know increases blood volume by retaining water and stimulating thirst. We don't have that. ADH is also a vasoconstrictor. We don't have that. Um, angiotensin II stimulates aldosterone to conserve water, pull salt in, which the water is gonna follow the salt. We don't have that. So we are keeping the blood volume down by turning off these things that are designed to increase blood volume. We're turning off these vasoconstrictors by keeping the blood vessels more relaxed. You're having lower resistance, which is keeping the blood pressure down, right? So make sure when you're kind of reviewing this that that all makes sense. Again, this renin angiotensin mechanism is very important in terms of understanding control of blood pressure, controlling mechanisms of these super common pharmaceuticals used to control blood pressure. So I do want to make sure you understand this. If on your exam, there'll be kind of, you know, kind of more fine-grained questions about what is going on at this renin angiotensin mechanism. So make sure you understand this. So Professor, one question. In a nutshell, what uh, angiotensin II does is increase bo blood volume by all these mechanisms as well so, as increasing vasoconstriction and resistance by these mechanisms as well. Okay. It, it both it increases both resistance to flow resistance. through vasoconstriction and you know, through its own actions and through the actions of ADH. And then it's also doing the long-term things with the volume. Thank you. Um, Will the uh, thyroid hormone T3, T4 also control blood pressure? Um, that's, it's, that's a different thing. Let's, let's not bring that in right now. Um, what else? I can also, sometimes people talk, say RAA mechanism, 
like renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism. So sometimes you'll see it written as that instead of just renin angiotensin, but I usually just call it renin, renin angiotensin mechanism. Um, okay, that took way longer than I thought. Um, What other things do I want to say in terms of blood pressure here? So when you're thinking about controls of blood pressure, Again, sometimes we're thinking about kind of the body as a whole. Um, in which case the blood pressure we're usually talking about is the mean arterial pressure. This is kind of like the average arterial and we're usually talking on the systemic side. Right, and basically the mean arterial pressure is going to be some mix. It's gonna be, you know, the flow, cardiac output times resistance. You know, and again, it's important for you all to remember the ways that we can control this. There is one mechanism that's outside of this equation, which I said is blood volume. So blood volume is off kind of on the side. So don't forget blood volume. But for the more short-term control, the things we have are resistance and cardiac output. You know, how do we adjust resistance? Vasoconstriction. Yeah, vasoconstriction. By constricting or relaxing, you can adjust, bring this up or down. For cardiac output, Cardiac output, we have to drill down a bit. This is stroke volume times heart rate. So I can adjust cardiac output through either of these. If I wanna bring my blood pressure up, I can increase my heart rate because that's gonna increase cardiac output, which will increase my blood pressure, right? If I want to increase my cardiac output, I can also increase stroke volume. And what are ways to increase stroke volume? Decrease end systolic volume. Uh-huh, so I can increase my end systolic volume by um, increasing how tight, how strongly the heart contracts. So this can happen by, you know, increase contractile strength of the cardiac muscle. Um, one of the things that does this is epinephrine. You know, your, your sympathetic nervous system can actually increase the strength, right? So we talked about this a bit. One of the reasons epi epinephrine is gonna do all these different things to increase your blood pressure. Epinephrine, adrenaline, is actually a vasoconstrictor, increases your um, resistance. Epinephrine increases your heart rate. Epinephrine increases the contractile strength of the cardiac muscle, which actually not, de I'm sorry, decreases end systolic volume. There's less left over because it's squeezed harder. So by decreasing end systolic volume, I increase stroke volume. So both increasing heart rate and increasing stroke volumes and increase cardiac output. So epinephrine is doing all this stuff to bring your heart rate up, not your heart rate, bring your blood pressure up, both through increasing heart rate, increasing stroke volume, which collectively increase cardiac output, increasing resistance. Um, if somebody is in anaphylactic shock, Anaphylactic shock is when you have this kind of systemic vasodilation. If you had some allergic reaction and all your blood vessels dilated, what's gonna happen to your blood pressure? 
it's going to plummet. It's going to plummet because if the vessels dilate, then again, resistance goes down and your blood pressure is going to drop. I think I've mentioned this. Um, whoops. Hold on, I am having technical difficulties here. All right. Again, mean arterial pressure, cardiac output times resistance. Sometimes this is also called peripheral resistance. I think I told you once I had, I breathed in a huge, huge um, cloud of like spores that were from my compost um, bin that had gotten totally moldy. And all my vessels dilated, my skin just turned completely flushed. I had major vasodilation all over my body. And for the next few hours, my heart rate was, was somewhere like around like 160 beats per minute. It was a little scary. Um, I checked my blood pressure. My blood pressure was stable, but in order to keep my blood pressure stable, my body had to increase the cardiac output, in which case, again, stroke volume times heart rate. My heart rate just went through the roof, which kept my cardiac output up, which was dealing with the diminished resistance to flow, and that stabilized my, our, my pressure until my vasodilation kind of ended. When people have this really bad, like anaphylactic shock, which you can get from a bee sting or from a, eating a, some you know, peanut allergy even, if this really plummets and you can't adjust, you need to do something really fast to make sure that the blood pressure stays up. You know, what do you do to somebody who is in anaphylactic shock? EpiPen. The EpiPen which is basically this little thing you jam in their thigh that injects epinephrine, adrenaline into their body. And what is that gonna do? All these things we just mentioned, that epinephrine is going to increase resistance, which will increase blood pressure, increase heart rate and stroke volume, which increase cardiac output. So all these things are gonna bring their blood pressure back up and hopefully save their life. So you know, when you're thinking about why, why should you carry around an EpiPen if you're worried about this, that's, you know, it's doing all this stuff. This is also, again, another major drug that is prescribed for high blood pressure are the beta blockers. So beta blockers, let's, um, let me erase some stuff here. A beta blocker is just simply a beta adrenergic oops, antagonist. And it is, these are, these receptors are on the heart. Why would it be useful to give somebody an adrenergic actinist blocking receptors on the heart if you're trying to keep their blood pressure down? Because it would prevent the epi, the adrenaline from reaching that to increase the heart rate. Exactly. It's going to keep the heart rate from speeding up, which keeps the cardiac output down which keeps blood pressure down. Also, it's going to block the effect of epinephrine on contractile strength and increasing stroke volume. So we're gonna keep stroke volume down, which keeps cardiac output down, which keeps the mean arterial pressure down. So your book has different charts. Um, maybe after this class, um, 
I should have a meeting right after class, but before I go to bed tonight, I'll also post, there's a really nice chart in the Sherwood text that kind of puts all these things together and all these things that all affect blood pressure, but it's this whole big array of things that all tie in that you should understand. Ultimately, you should all be able to kind of think about what happens if I move this or that up or down, how is that useful in controlling blood pressure one way or another? Um, so any questions about, about this? You know, there's a lot of things in here and a lot of interrelated things, but as you spend more time, it gets kind of pretty to see how all these things all kind of lock into each other and how you have lots of different things happening all at once to control your blood pressure. And there's lots of things I haven't mentioned that we're not gonna go into, but this is, this is giving you a nice kind of window into some of the major, major mechanisms that are happening to, to kind of control and maintain blood pressure. Okay, so I'm gonna spend just a little bit more finishing up some stuff about kind of blood flow and stuff. Um, we still have more to cover in terms of just what happens in capillary beds and this and that, but at least I wanna kind of tie up the idea of control of blood flow and all that. All right, so, and I am recording. Okay, so we've been, looking at this kind of more global look at, you know, control of blood pressure, making sure blood's flowing. Um, there's also this idea of local, local autoregulation. Of blood flow. So this is happening um, in a local area of tissue. Again, imagine you're just in some little area where there's some cells that you know need their oxygen and nutrients and you have blood vessels coming in to feed the region and flowing out. You know, so this, we're not looking at the big picture here of do we need to dilate or constrict based on mean arterial pressure? It's just, what are the needs of this local area of tissue? That's why we're saying local. Um, and some of the things here don't even use the nervous system at all. In fact, we're going to talk about two controls that are purely due to the properties of the smooth muscle in the walls of the blood vessels. Again, so you have to remember, I've mentioned this, you know, we'll t I, I don't know if I ever said it formally, but, you know, the vessels have smooth muscle in their walls. And I talked about how smooth muscle has lots of different ways that can trigger it to contract or relax as opposed to like skeletal muscle. And one was chemicals, just the chemicals around. Um, it turns out, um, at least in the systemic circulation, if we have kind of an increase in CO2 or decrease in oxygen, that's going to cause local vasodilation. No, yeah. So which, which makes sense. You know, CO2 is building up. There's not enough oxygen. We want more blood to flow in, right? Again, if we think about more locally, flow is going to be blood pressure divided by resistance. So if we are decreasing the resistance by vasodilating, assuming that the um, blood pressure is, is, is um, kind of staying the same, flow is gonna go up. Resistance and flow are inversely related. So increase in CO2 or decrease in oxygen in a local area of tissue is gonna cause the muscle in the vessels to relax 
cause vasodilation, allow more blood flow to perfuse. Um, the opposite happens. If you have a decrease in CO2 or an increase, increased amount of oxygen, this will be local vasoconstriction. Right, if you already have enough oxygen and the tissue is not you know, stewing in its own carbon dioxide, there's no reason to be sending a bunch of your blood there. So this is just kind of automatically hope it happening where you vasodilate or vasoconstrict as the smooth muscle is just responding to the levels of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the tissue in an appropriate fashion. You know, there are other things that can cause this. When we get to the immune system, we'll talk about part of the inflammatory responses like histamines and stuff will cause local vasodilation. That's part of, you know, the red and in inflammation, why everything gets kind of red and swollen is you dilate local blood vessels. So the other things can do this too, but here we're just talking about this one particular aspect. Um, what about the pulmonary circuit? What do you think is going to happen with this local autoregulation in the pulmonary circuit? Any thoughts? If the O2 is low in the uh, carbon dioxide is high, it'll be local vasoconstriction, vice versa. It's, it's going to be vice versa, right? If, because remember, the reason for going to the lungs is the opposite of going to the body tissues. You go to the lungs to pick up oxygen, not to deliver oxygen. So if you have low oxygen, high O2, I mean, low oxygen, high CO2, this is not where you want to send the blood in the lungs, right? We want to constrict if you're in the lungs because there's no oxygen to pick up. If there's a lot of oxygen in some region, this is where you're going to dilate in the lungs because this is where you want to send the blood. So this is going to be the opposite, right? So that's, that, that should make sense because the, the job is different. In the tissues, you want to take the blood that to the areas that need oxygen. In the lungs, you wanna bring the blood to the areas that have oxygen to pick up. So, so that's one aspect of local, local autoregulation. Um, another thing I mentioned, and I should mention, if there's an area that has been deprived of blood flow for a little while, um, here, the word ischemia, is when you are not having blood flow into some region. This is kind of lack of blood flow. Um, if you have, let's say you're blocking blood flow to some region and while you're lacking the blood flow, all of those conditions are gonna be building up. Carbon dioxide is gonna be building up and all that. So that means when you finally let the blood come back into the region, there's going to be more than normal. We talk about post ischemic reflow. Because once you allow the blood to go into that region, all those vessels are pre dilated. And so you're going to have more flow into the region than you would have otherwise. So that, that should make sense. Um, another thing about control, local control of blood flow that relates to the contractile properties of smooth muscle. We talked about smooth muscle also can be contracted to contract by, contra stimulated to contract by um, being stretched. So we're gonna look at blood pressure in more detail today, but blood pressure is going up and down and up and down. but we want kind of the flow through the vessels to be smoother. And that happens because the 
properties of the smooth muscle respond to this. So we talked about flow is blood pressure over resistance. So the blood pressure is going up and it's going down, it's going up and it's going down. When the blood pressure is going up, it's pushing out. If this is my blood vessel here, when the blood pressure is rising, I am pushing out, I'm stretching out that smooth muscle, which then causes a reaction where it pushes back and contracts. And that is going to increase resistance. So when the blood pressure is going up, the resistance goes up. When the blood pressure is dropping and I'm not pushing on the walls, then that smooth muscle relaxes and the vessel dilates and the resistance goes down. So you've got this thing where the resistance kind of follows the blood pressure. When the blood pressure is going up, there's a reaction that increases the resistance to stabilize the flow. When the blood pressure is dropping, the vessels relax, decreasing the resistance. But again, keeping this ratio the same, stabilizing the flow. So you have a relatively stable flow. Back. You know, even though the pressure is going up and down. So this is, so when you're looking at these little vessels, this is another thing that's kind of cool that's going on in there. Um, there's one other thing I should mention. Um, if you are chronically in this situation where there is not enough oxygen and too much CO2, you know, then it's not going to be able to be solved by like, let's just let's do some local vasodilation to let more blood in. What are you going to have to do if there's chronically not enough oxygen and too much CO2 in some region of your tissue. What's your body's response going to be? Anybody? I mean, what if you knew like you turned on all the hoses as much as you can and you still the swimming pool wasn't getting filled enough or something? I turn them off or diminish the flow. What, what, they, what you do is you actually, you get angiogenesis. You get bring, grow more blood vessels so you can bring more blood into the region. So angiogenesis means angio is having to do with the blood vessels, like an angiogram is where they kind of visualize your blood vessels. Genesis, creation, new, new creation. So this is just growing more blood vessels into the region. So that's another thing your body can do, can actually turn on these genes that turn on blood vessel formation. Um, Again, part of the reason we talked, you know, I mentioned briefly before, I'll mention again, part of the reason why being overweight is puts more stress on your heart. You know, all of that extra flesh that you're adding in as you add in more, add on the pounds, you've got to grow more and more blood vessels in order to serve that extra tissue. Um, what happens if we increase the length, the total length of the blood vessels? Resistance would go up. Uh-huh. And increased resistance means to have the same flow, my blood pressure is going to have to go be higher. So if I have increased resistance due to all this extra, extra like length of blood vessels to supply all my extra tissue, I'm gonna to have to have a higher overall blood pressure to keep everything going. You know, so just losing weight and diminishing the overall length of vessels 
Diminishing the resistance can help with blood pressure. So that's that's important to know. Um, uh, will the pH affect blood pressure as well? No, not really. Not in any way that I can think of particularly. Um, what else? The last thing, just briefly before we kind of end this, I'll just talk about kind of the distribution of blood to the main parts of the body, because um, this will help us as we get into the next parts of things. So blood flow through so tissue perfusion. So kind of blood flow into the different regions of the body. So let's say at rest. Again, these numbers are ballpark. Don't, don't take them super, super seriously. Um, the first one, there's the brain. And somewhere around 13%. And the heart, around 4%. These two pretty much, we're gonna talk about how the different regions can have different flows depending on the tissue's needs. These two are always basically staying the same. Even if you have uh, major blood, you know, you have drops in blood pressure, blood flow, blood volume, this or that, your body desperately does its best to make sure that the brain and the heart get everything they need, right? Because you're not winning if your heart is not functioning because everything goes downhill. You're not winning if your brain is not getting the blood it needs and you start having your you know, neurons start dying. Um, so the heart, and I talked about the brain, very intolerant of ischemia. It does not do well. Like again, you can fall asleep on your arm and your arm falls asleep and it comes back and we didn't have to amputate your arm. But if you like choke somebody for five minutes, they're dead. Right, so the brain is very different than your other tissues in terms of how poorly it deals with lack of blood flow. Um, muscles. So the muscles, I should say skeletal muscle around 20% of your blood flow at rest. So how much, how much is that in liters? This is a good, a good little like quiz. How many liters per minute are the muscles getting at rest? I see Maria, one, about one. Remember we talked about average cardiac output at rest is about five liters per minute, 20%, a fifth of that, it's about a liter per minute. Um, at rest, only like 10% of the capillary beds are open in the muscles. Right, right now, when you're sitting in front of your computer on your butt watching Zoom, you don't need to have a lot of blood going to your muscles. They don't need to make lots of ATP and all that. Um, so you only have 10% of the capillaries open. When your muscles are really going for it, you can open up, you can increase the blood flow by 10. Um, you know, 10 times going into your muscles. So, so that's, um, I think that's important to remember. Um, you know, this is something we're gonna see in the lab today when we do um, the exercise part. We're gonna see people doing exercise and we'll see their response to their blood pressure. Um, they're gonna have to really increase their, um, their blood flow. And again, cardiac output is basically 
you know, blood pressure times resistance. Um, no, over resistance. You know, so we're going to be increasing the um, blood pressure quite a bit to increase the flow to deal with all the excess needs of the, the muscles. Um, what else? There are also parts of the body that get way more blood than they need than for just um, delivering, you know, taking care of the tissues, metabolic needs. Um, for instance, the kidneys. You know, your kidneys are about the size of a small bar of soap. They're little bitty deals. And yet they're getting somewhere between a fifth to a quarter of your entire cardiac output. And that's because they are processing the blood. We're gonna talk about this in much more detail. They're doing all the fluid balance and electrolyte balance and waste disposal and pH balance and all that stuff. So they're getting a huge amount of your blood flow. Again, between one to one and a quarter liters per minute of blood going into the kidneys. You know, obviously not because the kidneys need that for oxygen and nutrients. It's because the kidneys are dealing with processing of your blood. Same thing, your digestive organs. Um, what do I have here? Like around, I don't know, around 25%. You know, this is not just about making sure the tissues are happy. This is about picking up nutrients. Um, with your liver, it's also about processing blood and stuff like that. So, so skin is also another thing that has more or less blood, not just for what it needs. Your skin is, your the circulation of your skin is an important part of temperature control. Um, you can change your skin um, circulation I have here. Yeah, you know, can increase, you know, by up to 50 times. So depending on whether or not you're trying to radiate out heat to maintain temperature or conserve heat and keeping the blood closer to your core, you can radically change the blood flow to your skin. Again, and it's not about providing oxygen and nutrients. It's about temperature regulation. So just kind of putting that out there. We are going to be coming back in quite a bit of detail to this number next week when we get into the start talking about kidneys. Um, again, the fact that a quarter of your blood is going to your kidneys um, we'll spend a, a lot of time looking at what exactly is going on there. Um, what else do I want to say? All right. Questions about any of this? Uh, I have a quick question. Uh -huh. um, going back to the local um, autoregulation of blood flow for the pulmonary circuit, I understand the systemic side and I understand that the pulmonary would be opposite, but I just kind of don't understand the steps of going from like, like detecting increased carbon dioxide and then leading to like vasoconstriction of like the pulmonary arteries or something. Well, it's, uh, it's not even artery. It's just like the little vessels coming in and again, the, the little arterioles are gonna be blue, right? Cause they're deoxygenated blood. They're kind of coming in to the alveoli here. And if there is high oxygen, this is like yum, that's what they want. This is where they're gonna, there's gonna be vasodilation. If they're coming into an area and there's low oxygen, they're like, this is not interesting. I'm here to pick up oxygen and there's no oxygen here. So this is gonna be vasoconstriction. So we're not gonna be sending the blood to the areas with low oxygen. So does, does this make it clearer? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, it, and it's just kind of an automatic 
um, thing that happens between you know, these molecules and how they excite or inhibit the smooth muscle within the walls of the vessels. So this isn't even something where you have a big reflex with, you know, it's not like the baroreceptor reflex where baroreceptor signals go up to the medulla of your brain and then send messages back down the vasomotor fibers, the autonomic sympathetic fibers. This is just kind of a local thing happening. Gotcha, thank you. All right. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, for cardiac output, it's heart rate times stroke volume, right? Mm -hmm. But then you said, re just like a little bit while ago, you said cardiac output is blood pressure over resistance. I'm just, is it both? So there's two equations for cardiac output? Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, cardiac output is flow. All right. Now and, it, and in the big picture, I could say flow is pressure over resistance. Um, when I did this, when I kind of rearranged this as blood pressure is cardiac output times resistance, then it made more sense to realize, oh yeah, and we can substitute this in here, which is heart rate times stroke volume. And even there we can go, this is end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. So these are all, like if we're thinking about what are the, um, what are the kind of leave leverage points we have for adjusting blood pressure? We've got these two because those affect this, and then these two because those affect this, and then this times this because those ultimately affect this. So it was, this is useful to think about when we're talking about kind of control of blood pressure, or when we're talking about just increasing um, cardiac output, you know, you can, you can think about it this way, but you can also think about, oh, increase heart rate as well. We're gonna see that in our lab today. We're gonna look at when people are doing their exercise, their heart rate's gonna go up. Okay, because okay. So cardi to... cardiac output is just flow and there's two different ways you can think of, two different equations to, to look at it. Ex exactly. Okay. <laughs> this one is kind of more of a local, this is kind of like, you know, kind of direct in the heart. Whereas this is um, this kind of bigger picture. And here, here this is, is more like the mean arterial pressure, I should say, you know, the, the main systemic blood pressure. Okay, that's good. Any other questions? So you're talking about the, uh, ha the increase in oxygen uh, is when you have a Vasodilation. You're talking about one in the pulmonary circuit, right? Yeah, this is pulmonary. Okay. Yeah, it's the opposite if we're in the systemic circuit. Which is, I mean, it's kind of cool when you think about it. All right, other questions? Okie dokie. Um, 